Are You Ready for No Cartridge Live. <laughs> awesome. Then please welcome to the stage your host, Trevor Strunk. Hey, everyone. Uh, uh, hi. Um, a lot of you out there. Hi, nice to see you. I'm Trevor Strunk, Hagelbon on Twitter, and this is No Cartridge, live for the very first time. Now, I'm sure that you're happy to see me, but the person you've all been waiting for is right backstage, so let's have him come on right now. We have Mr. Night in the Woods himself, uh, well, one-third of Night in the Woods himself, uh, Scott Benson is here. Scott, come on out. That's your music. <laughs> that was theatrical confusion. <laughs> All right. So this thing was supposed to wave. Yeah, give, everyone. Him, give, him, give him a wave. Hey, man. Thanks uh, for coming. All right, good show. Yeah. Let's go. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, everyone. Get out of here. All right. Um, <laughs> That's our show. So um, I asked Scott here today to uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, well, one is because uh, you're pretty much on my show every four months or so, and yeah, I figure we're yeah. about to. Mm -hmm. um, the other reason is because uh, people may not know this about you, but you are uh, involved in game dev. Is that right? Allegedly. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing's been proven yet, but yeah. Um, so your your main thing that people will know you for at this point is Night in the Woods. Yeah, um, yeah. And you're you're still you're working on something new right now. I can't I can't yeah, I've never pried things. it out of you yet. What, yeah. what it is yet? Uh, <laughs> it would be funny if I just announced it all here. <laughs> <laughs> I was kind of hoping yeah. I could get you to slip, but no, no. Ah, well, okay. Sorry. Right. Um, but uh, we're gonna have to talk about the, your company because it's fascinating to me. The the structure and everything. Oh, okay, about yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. But we can we can get to that in the Q and A. One of the things that uh, I also called you here for is I just want to know what uh, makes people who love video games tick. What what they find aesthetically. interesting interesting, what they find, you know, story-wise, narrative, design, anything at all. Uh, so I asked Scott to pick a couple games that he found uh, profound or interesting or compelling or uh, formative for him, uh, and he picked these two. Uh, so we're going to keep the second one a secret for now, but start off with the first one, which is, uh, well, why don't you introduce it? Uh, so this game, this is great, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I like this it's whole thing. <laughs> so cool. Gamer on. Um, <laughs> So this game is Super Brothers Sword and Sorcery. Uh, how many people here are familiar with this game? <laughs> All right, yeah. Hey, give us a round of the, applause yeah, for Super Brothers. It's so good. Um, so excellent music in this game. Um, so uh, uh, I don't come out of game dev. Um, I guess now I do. But like we kind of like, it seemed <laughs> like we like stumbled in through like the side door, basically. Because it's like, growing up, I wanted to make a video game. Or I wanted to get into that. But it's like one of those things where you're like, you know people like go to the moon and there's like coding <laughs> involved and you see like reams of paper coming out of printers and a bunch of stressed people looking at like monitors and all that and, uh, and stuff, but you could not yourself go, all right, cool, well, that looks easy, I'll go do that. <laughs> and so like game dev seemed like, like completely spooky magic to me growing up just because I didn't have access to like learning how to code or anything. Spooky we were just talking like rocket science. Yeah. yeah. We, <laughs> we were just talking about this backstage, how it's like my family, like we couldn't afford computers growing up. So I had like garage sale computers in the nineties. It was like the PC Junior from nineteen eighty one and uh, <laughs> an old broken down like super old Macintosh and everything. And like I had I had a ki I had King's Quest on the big floppy for the PC Junior and it had a scratch somewhere in it. And so you'd get to a certain couple points a in the game and it would just be like, disc read error. So like, I never, I don't, still don't know what's up certain staircases in that game. Do you know what, do you know what happens? Uh, uh, the, the main character dies. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, no, that's not what happens in King's Quest, everyone. Just go well, back Well, and actually, no, <laughs> King's Quest has a whole lot of player death in it. Like, well, yeah, no, I mean, yeah. Constantly, because well, Roberta Williams is like, fuck you. Um, <laughs> but it's I like, welcome next. to my fantasy land. Fuck you. Um, <laughs> and stuff. So, uh, um, so... In, this game came out in 2011, which we'll talk about in a second, but like I played it in 2012 when it came to, um, to uh, on Steam, and I'd been a, f a huge fan of Craig, uh, Super Brothers art, for a long time, because I come out of doing animation and illustration and stuff, and Craig had this amazing style that wasn't like pixel art in the sense that it, like, it didn't feel like it was trying to capture this retro vibe or reproduce this hardware aesthetic. Um, it was almost like mosaic. You know, it, yeah. it has like such a different feel to it. It's been aped so much since then, but like, um, so that's how I first heard about it. I was like, oh, Craig's making this iPhone game. I didn't know his name was Craig at the time, and I thought <laughs> Super Brothers was two people because it's plural. Um, See, I still thought it was. Yeah. You're teaching me something here. There's multiple Craigs. No, but like, so, uh, 
Um, so I was like, oh, that's cool. But it was on iPhone. I couldn't afford a smartphone at the time or anything. And so like this, uh, so when this came out, it's good to go in here. You're going to learn all the things Scott couldn't afford by the end of this yeah, show. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> couldn't afford a horse, <laughs> a boat, to go swim with dolphins. He can now, though. Don't worry. Yeah, no, it's fine. Yeah, we're, 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 we're small-time indie game tycoons now, so it's fine. Um, we're going out to swim with dolphins right after this um, <laughs> in the dark, stormy waters. All right, so this game was originally for, like, iPad, iPhone, and everything. So it's built around just touching things, right? And um, I don't love a lot of mobile games um, because I, I always, I'm like, I'm one of those guys who like needs actual buttons and like uh, controllers. Like I need like an actual like physical thing. But I love this game because of how physical it makes your, your touching. So this is like the first thing you see in the game and you just, you, you tap on him. <laughs> And you kind of can't get going. Yay! Uh, you with, can make uh, him dance a lot without without <laughs> going on it. And I had never seen anything remotely like this when I first played it uh, in early 2012. Um, and I don't think a lot of people I don't think a lot of people knew what to do with this game when it came out. Yeah, I mean, it reminds me a little bit. I don't is of another game. I don't know if you've played this yet or not, but a game that uh, just came out. I don't know, maybe like last year, called uh, Goragoa. You played Goragoa uh, yet? I have it in my Steam library. And I it's it's it it, it's a two-hour game. Like if you're ever yeah. in the mood for something that's really good and takes a short time, anyone uh, Goragoa is fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, but this reminded me a lot of Goragoa in that like it, it had the thing where you had to click on things you weren't quite sure about whether mm -hmm. they were the right thing to click on or not, and mm -hmm. you kind of had to work out the puzzle. But I mean, that's an innovative game from like 2018. Yeah, I've seen like what the central mechanic is, and I'm like, yeah. how do you design this? Like, but it's sort of the same idea here, where it's like. There are so many things that are not super, and we, we probably won't get to all of them, but like there's so many things here that are super unclear to touch, right? Mm -hmm. Like what do you touch? Like on this screen, of course, like it says, yeah. touch the two things. And it's great to like, and it's working out like, oh, how's your stereo set up? How's your stereo sound set up? Like, that's like teaching you real quick. It's like, yeah. all right, you're gonna be clicking on things. And also the sound is like important. One of the things I love about this game is how much care it gives to both its visuals and its sound. Mm -hmm. Like it really is about getting you to a place where you can like experience these in. It's not just like a cool thing that happens or whatever. <laughs> well, they're like, no, listen to this game. Yeah. Um, which is really neat. Like, I hadn't played a lot of games at the time that um, uh, that did that, that had been like, no, you just chill. Yeah. Just be in this space. And um, I love this guy who introduces it. I think it's called The Archetype. I think that's something. what we decided he's called, yeah. Something like that. The Archetype. Stan. Anyway, uh, he... Um, <laughs> And he's just here to kind of introduce you to it. This had Twitter integration. I used the Twitter integration on the last. Uh, the no cartridge account's been tweeting out things about uh, oh, Super nice. Brothers. Yeah. So all the dialogue in this game is 140 characters or less, and you could tweet every line of dialogue. So around 2012 through 2014 or whatever, like it was just the hashtag sorcery. Some folks remember this, um, and uh, and stuff. I loved it. A lot of people who follow me did not love it. They're, fa they're phasing uh, it out of the uh, the switch. Won't do it. They're yeah. phasing it out. It's understandable. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Twitter's it's going to Mastodon. Twitter's uh, a little different. Yeah. But no. No. Yeah. It's actually Gab. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> really bad news about oh, no. the Super Brothers. Uh, I just like the idea of Super Brothers rage quitting Twitter. <laughs> like that's it. I'm out. I will be back to promote certain things. Okay. That's it. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Super Brothers had someone call them out for a problematic post. Yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> it just like went off about fake friends for a little bit, and then <laughs> that was it. And like, um, but <laughs> now I'm just picturing, yeah, like the folks who go back and like obsessively catalog like people's like like unwoke moments from like five or ten years ago. But it's all the Super Brothers tweets. <laughs> this is like um, not a good look. One of the, <laughs> not this ain't it, Chief. Um, <laughs> but like, uh, so the. Um, this is going to be the most Twitter-focused show that's ever yeah, been uh, here. unfortunately. How many of you follow one of us on Twitter? Oh, god damn. Oh, well, that's actually right, far cool. less than yeah. I thought, which is great. All it right. means we're actually getting an audience outside of that terrible but, place. But no, that's all, the, that's all the jokes I know, though. Oh, well, so. we should get into the game, then. All right. So, um, <laughs> so you, could, you, could, you could hook up your uh, social media to it, and um, it, it just says it's intended to be used in moderation. Twitter, known for its moderation. And... Um, <laughs> Uh, and I loved how it was written. I hadn't played a game that just talked like how like my friends and I just like jokingly talked around or something. I was gonna ask you like how much of this writing actually inspired you in some of the scripting in Night in the Woods? Because I mean, a lot of it feels like the 
you know, like the Greg rules okay, or yeah. like you know, like we got to go do crimes or whatever. Like, yeah. it feels like that really. And I mean, I, I'm saying that kind of jokingly. I love Night in the Woods. I love the writing on it. Um, Scott knows this. I've Terrible. talked about it all the time. But like, um, you know, this seemed really similar to me. Like, this seemed yeah. like it was a, it, of the same spirit. Yeah, it was less that this was an influence and more like this is something I recognized. Okay, like people who would just be like. There, there's, there's bits in this game where you'll get something, right? You'll like achieve some sort of quest, and it's like, oh, we got the megatone, and we feel really smart right now, <laughs> or something. And it's just like, that's how I would talk to someone or to a friend. You're just like, we're talking right now. Yeah. Whereas video game dialogue is usually so stylized, or it's trying to be very real and gritty or in some sort of manner. Um, whereas this had a level of just kind of casual burn to it over the mm -hmm. whole thing that we just really recognized. Um, and so I think one of the reasons why this game, which I should probably get into actually yeah, playing. Yeah, we should probably um, click, click through at this point. Yeah, the uh, click through, blah, 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 this game. <laughs> um, but, uh, we love the writing, click through the writing. Yeah. <laughs> Less writing in games, please. Um, you can tap on the on the water here, which I love, and on some of the bushes. Not here. There are bushes. Yeah. So it's gonna, and this is how you move around. This is very much made for tapping. Uh, that's the Scythian, that's Dogfella. Later on, you'll meet Logfella, um, <laughs> who is a lumberjack. Not, not too much later on. <laughs> yeah, like right around. This is, uh, I believe this character is just called Girl, I think. Um, yeah, it's <laughs> I like her introduction a lot. Yeah. Um, so it's just girl all, you know, all the, uh, the, you know, uh, like in 2010, there just wasn't a lot of stuff that felt like this, or 2011 when it first came yeah. out. Um, it's just the, as girl, and she seemed nice. There's just this casual, like, yeah, man, so this is what happened. So I went down <laughs> and did this, and yeah, and she seemed cool. Like, there's I'm this level of, like, casualness to it that I literally had never seen in another video game. Before someone can probably point out, it's like, well, actually, and <laughs> blah blah blah. There's this. There other will thing. be a Q and A where you can well actually, yeah. Scott. Yeah, it's um, true. But there wasn't like, um, yeah. Uh, where's my pointer? There we are. Um, and and stuff. Just the casualness of it, and the fact that it felt what is to me like normy. Like it was just like you know, this is just how you casually speak to people, <laughs> or if you were kind of telling a story to someone, like how you'd talk to them. And, and stuff, and I just literally had never played a game like that before. One of the, and that was part of kind of why this game is super important to me. Let me zoom out. Also, just this art's so the gorgeous. Art's so good. It's so great. Um, and this is what I'm talking about with the, with the pixels, particularly at the time. Like, this does not look like any console. It is kind of using the shorthand of pixels to create more of this, like, mosaic-like feel to it as opposed to going, hey, this is, like, the best NES game. Like, something like Shovel Knight, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's impressionist. I yeah. Mean, it, unlike Shovel Knight, you're right. Like, yeah. Shovel Knight's great, but, like, oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's yeah. totally something that you could see on... Or, um, uh, what's that game that, uh, 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 oh, uh, Devolver just put out with the, um, uh, where, it, like, it switches between NES and Super NES graphics? Messenger. Yeah, Messenger, where it's, like... Way to spoil the big twist in that game. They spoil it in the trailer. Oh, do they? I haven't seen it. <laughs> No hey, one watched the trailer to Messenger. To yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, like that, that's like, there's a very sort of like, a, a, um, I don't know, aping quality to it where yeah. it's like trying to get something right. And this is just doing its own thing. Mm -hmm. um. <laughs> so <laughs> one of the things about this game is it got really maligned at the time for it's like, oh, it's so hipster. It was because like gamer and kind of nerd culture shit is only allowed to be like one of six flavors. <laughs> You can do that's, like that's way too many flavors. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> One of five flavors, perhaps, um, and stuff. Uh, and um, so, a game like this, or something like Night in the Woods, where we I was going to say, isn't your game often maligned as? Yeah, sister? it's well, it's because like so, game aesthetics. The way that you're allowed to do game aesthetics is either primarily you need to make something that demonstrates the power of the hardware that the consumer bought. So it's just like. When you're playing The Witcher 3, a game that I really love, no one asks, why does the grass look so good? No one ever asks that. Like, no one else is like, why does that horse look like a horse in Red Dead Redemption 2? <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> but if you do something like this, people are like, what are you trying to pull? <laughs> like, there's got to be some social element to this. You're just trying to prove that you're cooler than me or something. And it's like, no, there is just a world outside and, <laughs> and stuff. And so, like, when we got into games, none of the art that I was doing before then was 
for video games. It was like independent animation, like friends with comic makers and zine people. I spent years doing like merch like for like punk and metal bands and stuff like that. And it just came out of that. It wasn't because we were trying to be cool. It was like, no, this is literally the way that yeah. I draw. And w the way the writing came out was um, literally just the way that we talk and about things that we knew. And that was difficult, I think, for some yeah. folks because there's just things within games are so targeted. It's not that everyone who makes games can only has five references or this or that. It's just that there's these understandings of what is acceptable within those uh, those aesthetics well, and, and the in the way that those uh, and the voices. And the gaming marketplace is so. I mean, it's so constrained. I mean, you see, like, even. I mean, obviously, like the 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 story that just came out was the the reviewer who gave Red Dead Redemption 3.5 out of 5. Bastard. And a bunch of, well, a bunch of gamers were like, we're gamers, we can find your house and your family and yeah. we will kill you. Well, this is um, classically <laughs> what happened to Carolyn Pettit when she was at GameSpot. I think she gave GTA, what is it, an 8.5, 7.5, something like that? Something that was GTA still a like good score. And like, still <laughs> gets people who were like, I'm going to find you about it. And it was like really like dangerous shit. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's that. And then there's also like the, the review bombs where the people will be like, well, this game just got SJW. Everyone knows how they have to do. And people storm steam and give yeah. it all negative reviews and people lose their shirts. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's totally clear that it's like, it's fair that there's a, there's a, I mean, not fair, but it's understandable that people feel constrained. Yeah. The funny thing about uh, our game is that, like, there is uh, obviously our game's somewhat leftist. It's pretty SJW, um, you guys. A little bit. <laughs> and... People would send me screenshots, They're like on this forum, you know, they're talking about how much like they hate your game and they're gonna come after you. And I would go. This is back when I cared about that stuff. Now, like, I'm just like, why in the world would I go check that? But when it first came out, I was like, oh, really? Huh? And uh, <laughs> so I would go over every single time, basically. Like, there'd be a bunch of people who were like, oh, there's a bunch of gay shit in this game, and it's all like communism. And we should go do something. And then one guy would be like. I don't know, man. I thought it was pretty funny, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so always some sort of, like, internet Nazi prick would be like, I know, but Greg's funny, man. <laughs> like, there would be that kind of thing. Or, like, you know, I just want me and B to get together, and that's why I'm angry or I'm not, something. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, well, at least you're mad about that. <laughs> I, don't really like, I don't really like the way Stormfront interpreted your game, but I'm glad <laughs> yeah. they bought it. Yeah, no, it was, uh, <laughs> it was good. Um, so that, that's kind of saved us a little bit of the review bombing because... For some reason, our game in particular, none of these guys could actually get it together enough mm -hmm. to like really come after us because they're just like, but Sharkle, yeah. the shark, he's funny and stuff. So I was like, whatever, fine. Yeah. I'm just going to be over here. You do your thing over there. Um, oh, yeah, so this is Logfella. So we've got Logfella and Dogfella here. Um, and he seemed cool. Um, I like the one thing that I don't think is hipster about this dialogue. It reminds me of like they met a girl named Girl. Like uh -huh. they, they, they went into a field and met a girl named Girl. It almost sounds like some sort of E.E. E. Cummings style, like <laughs> nonsense bit. poetry, or like Dogfellow Logfella sounds like um, I don't know, like like some sort of W.H. Uh, Auden uh, morphing. Like there's a there's a quality of like actually good writing in there. Yeah, yeah. It's not just it's not just twee. It's not like you said. It's not just like the, yeah. Ooh, ooh, we have we have a, a good doggers here. Let's yeah. give them a pop. Oh my bed. god. Yeah. You know, I'm like, just imagining <laughs> like the oh look, look at look at the heckin' small doggo yeah. here. Yeah. <laughs> Um, that's gonna age well. Uh, the uh, that's actually what all they have the on games the that are made right now that ha that are they're like ah heck doggos and stuff like in five years people will be like what the fuck was I thinking? <laughs> it's like yeah it was it was it was an age of fascism and people saying doggo yeah. a lot and, and and puppers. That's what the um, history books will say. Yeah. Um, so anyway, at this point. Um, we have a limited time with this game, so I'm going to get rolling here. Um, yeah, I think we have probably like five or six more minutes. Sweet. Well, we're not going to get to uh, later stuff, but <laughs> that's you know, fine. You get the idea. Fine. Yeah. Um, so they kind of just give you tasks in here, and they don't do a lot to explain why you should do them, um, other than going like, oh, it's your woeful errand, or like, oh, you're on a quest to do this. And that's it. Like, there's no great, like, There'll be moments where people will say, like, you, you know, I told, we, we told, uh, it's always, like, uh, first person plural, which they call second person, which took me way out of the game, I gotta <laughs> tell you. Yeah. I got really upset. Um, but uh, <laughs> some of you know I'm not joking. Um, but the, uh, they'll say, like, we told, uh, we told Logfella our woeful errand, and he seemed to understand, and then he got bored and fell asleep. And, like, it'll, it'll say that they told someone else the woeful errand, but you never hear it. I mean, at least in these early parts of the game, it's not like you actually hey. hear why you're doing this stuff. Yeah, but you, and you don't need to, which is like 
great. It, it, it does a lot with the fact that, like, the music is so good. And uh, it does a lot with the fact that, like, do you really need to know? Yeah. Like, do you need to know why this is? The game talks a lot about archetypes in the sense of, like, you, do you need to know you're going to get the thing? <laughs> and it deals with a great, I feel, a great emotional depth of that, of just the fact of, like, yeah, there's a level of being destined and stuff, but it doesn't, it's not about you making the player feel like this destined uh, type thing. You're just in this space, you understand why it's important, mm -hmm. and that's it. Just go. Yeah. You know, kind of thing. Um, I, I love the shuffling idol uh, that she does there. Um, it's great when you when you click on a character and they start like talking in real voice. Yeah. Like one of the two, one of the the developers are just like, uh, hey, they're just like, hey man, I guess you don't have much to say, so uh, all right, bye. Yeah. <laughs> so it's really really. Good. Yeah, you can meet the uh, the the primary musician Jim Guthrie who uh, who did the soundtrack, and and some of these other people you can click on and it's just be a voice being like, hey, and that's it. So this is the fighting. This is very much made for iPad. Um, it's pretty fun though. It, it, it's all right, yeah. All right. So you could you get to click on these for it. Yeah. Fuck you, wolf. Um, you you develop kind of a relationship with this wolf over over the course of the game. You do. It keeps coming back. Yeah. It's by by sad. the end, some might even say you have a respect for one another. Uh, <laughs> and uh, not me. It's a really easy enemy. Yeah, oh, it's so good. Um, and uh, it was also a game that was highly atmospheric without hitting you over the head with the fact of the, like, well, this is important art yeah, or something. Like, this has a level of just casual fun and, like, um, uh, just kind of like, hey, man, it's cool. Let's just go hang out and, you know, do this big quest and stuff. And it, it has really great emotional beats later on um it just kind of keeps going in this level there's a they do a thing in here where um we were talking about this before the show where yeah. they say hey don't play this all in one go like this is meant to be played in sessions it'll it'll say hey you know it, it, like finish at, the first session yeah why, at, why, at why not take a break at different chapter breaks it also has the greatest chapter breaks in video game history Which i'm just trying to you. sell you all on this game by the way it's uh, like five dollars available on steam. steam it's available on iphone it's coming to switch i think it is well um, <laughs> we were gonna play it on switch but they said it was coming out in october yeah so i thought that was probably like a little dicey um, like we just like up the, updating the switch store while we're here at the venue yeah <laughs> come um, on <laughs> But it, but it says, hey, you need to go, you should probably go and play this in sessions, which is great. It's great when a game tells you to turn it off, you know, and says, hey, for the real experience here, you're going to need to just chill and live with this a little bit. Scott was a big fan of The General and Metal Gear Solid 2 saying, Snake, haven't you played long enough? Like, <laughs> <laughs> I've never played that game. So. Oh, there's a part where he says that. Okay, cool. Your, your boss says, uh, you know, you should stop playing video games for a little while. It's mm -hmm. important. Um, God. Okojima. He was invited to this, but he didn't come. He didn't come. He was on yeah. the guest list. Bastard. <laughs> we comped um, him. So, uh, Colors of a Rainbow. We Scythians love the rainbows. <laughs> um, but one of the things it does, it, it'll say, like, hey, this first session, which is what they call it. I, I think you have to pull out your sword. Yeah, there you go. And um, you... Oh, here we go. Um, uh, it'll say, hey, this will probably take like 15 minutes. And then the next one is like, oh, it'll probably take an hour. And then the third one goes, this next one will take an entire lunar cycle. And they're not joking. This game has a third uh, act that changes based on the phase of the moon in, in the real world. And what <laughs> that was great. It's like five people just went, your mind. <laughs> yeah. Um, which is really cool. Um, and uh, we have Digital Chasm and we felt super smart. Um, <laughs> So yeah, this will, uh, we saw a burdensome book for Sinister Sorcery known as the Megatome. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> I love that. Just the and then get out alive. Yeah. Like there's something just so, again, just so casual about all this like sword and sorcery shit that's in the game, like literal sword and sorcery They stuff. also don't explain why it's sorcery other than that it's kind yeah. of funny that yeah. Sword has a silent W, but sorcery doesn't. Yeah, I think that's basically the entirety the of, of the whole thing. <laughs> and it's the kind of game that will put that in the title, you know. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's really great. The, um, the lunar cycle thing is a great example of this game doing something that seems 
unbelievable. Like, no one in the world would design that ever, mm-hmm. you know? Well, and no one in the world would design it and then not brag about it, right? Yeah. Like, it's not the central con- it's not the central conceit of the game. They yeah, it's the not thing called, like, they... Lunar Souls or something. Yeah, right. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, no, no, no. Writing that down. Yeah, that everyone name. forget you heard it. Our um, next game's Lunar <laughs> Souls. <laughs> But, like, it's, it's this thing where you see the moon so often, but you kind of just forget it. Like, it's in every s- important screen, even that, like, l- uh, what you called, like, the lounge or the lobby. Of the yeah, game. I was calling it the lobby. The lobby, where, like, there's, like, a screen where there's a moon there and the boss, but you forget that it's there. And it's, I mean, I was playing this yesterday, and the moon looked exactly the same as it does today. It tracks, mm-hmm. like, date and time and just throws this at you. It's like, oh, yeah, just, like, look at the moon. You'll figure it out. Like, that's crazy. That must have taken so much work to make this happen. And they just yeah. kind of, well, whatever. And, and they were like, we're okay with losing players. Because yeah. I bet if you talk to a lot of people and they're like, I put that on this game, it's like, well, I, the full moon was two days ago, and then I forgot to pick it back up later on. I have so much respect for that decision to go, yeah, we want to do this. We think that this works for the game that we want to make, the kind of vision we have. And we're okay with the fact that it's going to lose a whole bunch of people. Um, there's something about, particularly when, when this game came out, um, the kind of Dark Soulsification of games where it was okay to, to like, you know, the Roberta Williams of, of games is just to be like, fuck you, we have an idea and you're going to go with it and, <laughs> it's going, and stuff. And for something like Dark Souls, um, we talked about this on our Demon Souls podcast. We've talked but, about this on um, every podcast you've been on. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> it was the fact that, like, um, when, when Dark Souls dropped in, like, 2009, it was such a breath of fresh air because we were in the era of, like, Fable 2, uh, which is a great game, but, you know, golden bread uh, breadcrumb trail that you yeah. follow. And there's no real, like, sort of um, consequences for a lot of different things. And it, it was in that kind of post we moment where everything was about how do we get like the people who like maybe like 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 death in games is a design error was kind of a thing i think peter molyneux might have said that Ugh. or something <laughs> um n- noted n- noted always noted right guy genius, uh, peter molyneux, uh, peter molyneux <laughs> uh and uh, he stuff. Got, he's in the audience tonight peter come on up oh. thanks <laughs> Uh, he's gonna hear about that we just uh, talk shit on it. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna get tweeted. Like, <laughs> blimey! But the um, so um, that's that was not amazing. Is that, 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 is that your real British accent? That's not the correct British <laughs> accent. But like, um, so uh, it was the fact that so like that kind of um, mania Ooh, of, a signal. of a certain kind of um, show him the bad guy and then we'll, uh, we'll yeah switch. and then we'll then we'll we'll do this. Um, so that kind of mania for a particular kind of assumed accessibility, like. Nowadays, a lot of the accessibility talk is about actual like accessibility issues mm-hmm. of like, yeah, uh, sp- some people can't physically play this game or something. Right. No, some people can't physically use these particular controllers. Yeah. Or right. Sure. And when we talk about accessibility for different kinds of people, uh, now it's like, oh, we understand that you know women play video games, you know. But back then, accessibility was like, you know, we can we we need to get women to play video games. Let's make cooking games. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of thing that you look back on now, you're like, eee, yeah. you know, that kind of thing is just that like it was kind of um, I think a, a not particularly mature way of talking about these things and one of the things I loved about Dark Souls when it came out was that it was a game that made its intentions very clear and it was like if you're into this come and play and poke at this if not this is just yeah. not for you yeah. and I, I love the fact that this game is a combo of highly accessible just tapping around that's not particularly difficult also you got to wait a month between two yeah, chapters right. <laughs> you know um, it's so, uh, it's just so, it's such a great singular piece of work that I have not played anything that's quite like it. Okay, we got to get my sword out. Yeah, just, uh, and then we'll switch. Alright. But you guys might guess that this is not going to go so well for our hero here. Yeah. Th- th- this kicks off some problems. Uh, and, uh, uh oh. We're gonna book it out of here as fast as this sprite will go. Um, even this. We, should we leave him on this cliffhanger? Yeah, we can do that. Yeah. All right, let's do it. Let's do it. Uh, okay, cool. I think we're supposed to do a dramatic fade out. Here. Oh yeah. Should this is this? Should we exit out or should we fade out? Oh. Oh well, we just. Uh, all right. Wow. Great. There we go. Okay, so that's sword and sorcery. <laughs> Um, All right, uh, don't forget to mute it. You should uh, uh, seriously, F10. seriously go play this game. It's uh, very cheap. Um, yeah, it really Also, is. a lot of the stuff we're talking about, this game was developed in, like, the late aughts. Like, this is a lot of stuff that you would see now and go, oh, that's cool. They're experimenting with these different things. But, like, at the time, like, ugh. 
there was just had been nothing like this. Now um, we're going to play a game that was developed even earlier than that. Though. Yeah. Um, it's similar in tone, obviously. <laughs> obviously. Um, All right, we got a picture. I think we're good to go. There we go. <laughs> okay, so who here knows what this game is? <laughs> All right. Anyone play this? <laughs> um, we're going to watch the entire intro to this. This is going to be the fun part of the audio only podcast. Oh, it's so good. No, keep dancing. This is good. The people who have never seen this before are like, what the fuck, man? <laughs> this is going to be in all of your heads for the whole rest of the weekend now. It's so good. Everything about this game is pure. Everything is, is so good. We're gonna burn through the entire rest of our time here just watching. Yeah, it's like, show. oh wow, we couldn't do the Q and A, unfortunately. Uh, <laughs> it's pretty short. There you go. So, I don't right. know how to follow that up. We were thinking about doing the uh, whole tutorial and everything like that, but we decided that actually it was just a better idea to do the most fun level we could. Yeah. And someone, the person we borrowed this from. Um, Oh yeah, you gotta go to the constellations. Yeah, so this this controller, some of it doesn't work. This is some, so we this have is to, some we real have, PS2 problems over here. We have to we have to we have to find it via this screen. Uh, we're looking for Earth. If you see a big blue planet, if you guys see Earth. Uh, let us know. All right. Um, <laughs> Earth. There's a, there's a mushroom. There's a mushroom that's not Earth. Um, uh, maybe go up. Yeah. Okay. Um, can you zoom out? We found... Oh, there it is, there it is! Where? Right, bottom, bottom right. Oh, uh, over, over, here? over here? No, no, over to your right. Is no, it, no, is no! It here? Okay. No, is Scott! It, <laughs> is, it, is, it, is it this one? Uh, I'm where? Where? Everyone where? yell the secret word at Scott! <laughs> where is it? I can't, I can't find it. Oh. So, no, we're not going to... Ah! Okay. <laughs> All right. Um... This is good because we like we definitely are our two PS2 era boys, and so like we were able to kind of uh, work this out a little bit. <laughs> yeah. I think it's down at the bottom. Yeah, yeah. I think it's uh, yeah, this guy it right seven. here. All right. Um, um, so here's the thing, um, Bethany, who's right there. She's uh, also the co-writer of Night in the Woods. She's 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 knitting something. So if you want to go ask her some questions about Night in the Woods or knitting. Um, you can uh, you can do that afterwards. But when we were dating in like 2005 or 2006, I invited her <laughs> over Sorry, and, and, was, and was like, "Hey, so I got this game," and because I was trying to Im Im impress her, and I was like, "This game is so much fun. It is so weird, and like I've never seen anything like it at all." And that remains true, by the way. Like, just I don't know where this game came out of, like other than yeah. Keita Takahashi's uh, uh, mind and. Um, we're gonna we're gonna skip through some dialogue here. Um, I don't even have time or to uh, to explain the premise of this game. This it's is really really briefly. The king uh, in sort of some sort of it's it's not said as drunken, but it's sort of like read as drunken uh, frenzy. Uh, blows up the moon, and you basically have to collect uh, basically make new stars and a moon yeah. uh, by collecting things on Earth and rolling them into these katamaris, and they go up in the sky and become the new stars. Yeah, and the the, the king has that's yeah, what I went to grad school to be able to do. There you this go. Is, yeah. nice. <laughs> um, he, he gets really excited about certain things and will just kind of start like talking to you as you're doing stuff. He's kind of like a little kind of peanut gallery type uh, thing. And you, you start off in like the earlier levels, um, uh, just collecting like thumbtacks and stuff and, um, and little things on desks. And by the end of it, you're rolling up like entire continents. Yeah. And uh, and stuff. This one will get pretty big, but it's not nearly like the biggest one you can make. So anyway, so when Bethany and I were dating, I'm, we're playing this. We went through two different PS2 controllers by just because we broke the thumbsticks <laughs> playing this game. Because this game is like all thumbsticks, basically. Like there's other little things you can do, but it's pretty much that. This is this is the extent of it. Um, so like, it's just a game that is just pure joy. I think front to yeah, back. Yeah, it's extremely well-meaning and very joyful. Like it's 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 just it's peaceful in a, in a way that I don't think a lot of games are. It's, and, uh, and yet hyper violent in the sense that you're like going <laughs> around up, yeah. and rolling, eventually rolling humans up, and they're like, ah, you know. 
Um, well, and I mean, the other thing about it is it's very challenging. Like, it's it's a tricky game in a lot of ways. A lot of levels are hard in that you have to you have a time limit and you have to get your Katamari to a certain uh, to a certain size. And it's like you have to keep moving pretty fast and you have to keep collecting things, and they better be big things. Yeah. So I'm playing this expertly right now, and w one of the things that you're missing because I'm doing that is how much trial and error there is when you're first starting out of what am I large enough to pick up? Yet? Right. Because as you grow, you can't pick up, like I can't pick up that car right now, and if I bash into it, I might like lose some items that will, that will fall off. So you have to kind of work your way up from, and there's something immensely satisfying about starting out as just like absolutely nothing and um, and ending up th this giant world like destroying yeah. blob that's like rolling up trees and uh, I don't always like I, I have a hard time getting into like revenge fantasy games where it's like now I'll get back the people I don't like like you know like even like Grand Theft Auto a lot yeah. of people play it for that like games like this though where it's like now I can finally pick up that thing that I wasn't allowed to pick up before is so satisfying. <laughs> it's like getting back at it. There are times <laughs> when like when like certain kinds of like game writing and certain game conversations um, I get a little kind of eh about because it's like folks have to prove why a game was hyper important to them in some like real way. Like it's a very real like I have to be like the 2016 election viewed through Katamari Damashi or something. <laughs> and I think all that stuff is good, but like there are times Wait when... Wait till the Q&A. Yeah, it's true. Oh. Um, but like the um, game is Bernie bro to me. So, uh, <laughs> but like, um, but something like this, there's just this, there, there's an element of this that is just like, yeah, it's just this joyful, joyful thing. Can I get up over this? I don't think I can. Oh, you'd yeah. have to jump. Oh, Which you don't have the capability. I don't, I don't have the capability. No, it's cool. I can get. I can get large enough. I can do this. I can. Do Our this. controller is broken. Yeah. Uh, so we can. Um, but no, it's cool, man. We can. Uh, we, we we have we have more than enough tools at our disposal. To I make should this be work. clear about the wonderful people at Caveat that they offered to go out and buy us a working controller. Yeah. Uh, to but go out and just source from the wild <laughs> a PS2 controller in the year of our Lord 2018. It should be like, like basically like if you've ever seen that Chappelle. Well, I'll, I'll reference the Chappelle show because that's what reminds me of Marty Thomas. Yeah, the same Chappelle's time go like making the band sketch where he uh, where he's like yeah. telling them to get all sorts of stuff like uh, Dylon. Yeah, it's a bit hot fire. Um, no one's watched this except us. Yeah, this is bad. <laughs> we're uh, there. We go. Now we're hey, sucking up some humans. There well, we go. You, yeah, you're knocking them over at least. Yeah, uh, once you knock them over, you can get them. There is something though, as I just kind of was talking about how you don't necessarily have to come up with a reason why a game is important to, to love it. This game, though, I think has this great emotional tie to it, which is the idea of starting out as this kind of solo, lonely person who is abused by this, like, aristocracy or whatever, this, like, king who fucked things up and now it's your job to fix it even though you did not fuck it up in the first place, and you have way less tools at your disposal than the king. Um, and now you have to go and create this much bigger thing out of much smaller things in order to actually solve the problem. It is unbelievable. Look at that, everyone. I, I, I pulled you some, some, some subtext job. out of this. but um, I mean, that does explain why it's so satisfying to pick up the king in the last level. Yeah, like eventually you, you, you can, can roll do. up the king. Which it is, is, it's so good. There is something also just Im immensely satisfying about being able to pick up uh, uh, objects. And there aren't a lot of games like this. I think the closest thing recently would be Donut County, mm -hmm. um, which you Donut should, all, you should all go play. If you, yeah. Especially if you like that kind of like casual, just chatting, uh, things that could be tweets uh, dialogue, um, and just uh, the super charming, cute di uh, art of this. Um, <laughs> and stuff that hyper stylized look, low res, low res thing. When I, so I was talking about sorcery when we were playing it how it was like um influential for me and it i do was like how you can pick up most people but sometimes if they're a little heavier yeah no they, i can't they, they get that rabbit yet you know <laughs> uh, but i can go up over that curve now so that's why i'm gonna head back there good um and uh, and stuff so sorcery we didn't get to it but on the on the credit screen come on <laughs> there we go so sorcery on the on the credit screen it bills itself as uh here's an artist here's a musician and then here's a dev team and before, yeah, before, like, when I was talking about it at first, how it's like games just seem like crazy magic rocket science or whatever, uh, seeing sorcery 
just talk about how it was made and what it was a product of, and it's this guy, this guy, these folks, and that's it. I immediately was like, oh, okay, I, there's something I can contribute to this. Like, I understand how that works. It's like, oh, a band records a seven inch and someone does a cool cover for it, or a comic, or a zine, and it was like, those were, that's a multimedia thing where a bunch of people have their own little, like, voices and bring it together. And that was literally the first time I'd ever seen game development discussed that way. Mm -hmm. And I, I talk a lot about kind of like just coming out of like the punk scene and like that kind of DIY space. Um, one of the best things that that scene does, or did for me at least, a lot of places do this, is it gives you permission. Mm. Um, and not in the sense that like an authority figure says, okay, you're allowed to go do this, but in the sense that you will see something or you'll see how something is done and you'll go, oh, this is a thing I can do. Yeah. And it's okay if I go do it. Well, even like even like I have a place in it, right? Yeah. Like I think that's one of the things that's important about Katamari from like a gaming perspective is like this just ultimately strange game comes out and people Ooh. love it and uh, it it allows people to enjoy strange games, <laughs> like unironically. Yeah. I think like there was a there was a very like and I don't I don't begrudge them this because I certainly read the articles, but like, you know, there's a very something awful sort of um, uh, feel about video games. The cops! <laughs> the <laughs> cops are trying to murder me! <laughs> Fuck cops! He got him. He yeah! Got him. There we are. Um, but there's like, there's like, you know, I mean, there was like a very real thing where like you found weird games and made fun of them. Like it was like, oh, this game's goofy. Like, let's, let's, and there was let's a lot of racism with that of like, oh, Japan, you know? Yeah, sure. Yeah. But like this game came out and everyone's like, actually, wait, no, we love weird games. Like, we, these are actually awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I think they're great. I think this was the, the entryway. Thanks, King. Um, go off, King. Uh, the, uh, but uh, the, uh, yeah, and I think that there was, it was just how charming this game is and how like, it was, and I, I'm sure a lot of people did, but like, for, particularly if someone was inclined to be like the "lol Japan so weird" thing, you just wanted to hug it, and you wanted to like, you wanted to, you didn't want to other it in that way, right? Yeah. Like, you were doing that was like, it was definitely, I think, a game that won a lot of people who might have been just super dismissive of interesting games, uh, Japanese games, um, a lot of just really cool stuff because it was like, I can't deny this. I can't go like, you know, I can't put this in quotes yeah. or something. I just, you either on, you have to, if you love this game, you love it pretty unironically and right. pretty sincerely. No one's like an, a finger quotes, you know, Katamari, Katamari Damashi guy, fan, yeah. right? Like if you love Katamari, Katamari Damashi and you played it, you're like, I want to go I just play love it right this game. now. Yeah. yeah, I just love it. I um, think. I mean, the other interesting thing about this is, it's a game where. Um, I mean, it's a game that, I don't know, contextualizes the silliness so well that, it, it kind of like, retroactively ah. allows for games like. Um, uh, good, you got you got friend of the podcast Rob Grant back, um, but um, <laughs> you, uh, um, you know, it, it allows for games like, uh, you know, like Mario Two, like. Um, Doki Doki Panic. Yeah, Doki Doki Panic, um, where people were like, well, that was the bad Mario. And uh, now people are like, well, actually, that Mario rocks. And, like, it's yeah. very interesting. I think that this, um, I, I hope that we're kind of past the point of just, like, like I said, just like, oh, this is so weird. This is just so, well, well random. Well, I mean, Donut County did well. Yeah, and, like, that, that kind of thing. I think, like, Donut County kind of design um, is very influenced by this. I failed, by the way, because I was talking during it. Look how sad the prince is. <laughs> how angry the thing. I think we have time to maybe try this one more time. Or do we? What do you guys think? Is uh, that a thumbs up or down? Uh, we're looking. That's a seven. We have seven minutes. Seven minutes. Okay, we can do this. Um, but before we move on to our I next demand deck. the controller. Oh <laughs> shit. Okay. All right. Now you can. Now you won't lose because you're talking. Now, now what I'll heck? lose because we're talking. Nice. When's the last time you played this? Um, <laughs> 2005. Okay. Nice. Uh, All right. Thir Thirteen years ago. <laughs> move, follow us back to the George W. Bush administration. <laughs> I think I, I Donald went, Rumsfeld had a job. I probably um. went and played this after the uh, the guy who owned the barber shop that I lived in uh, in college. I lived above, rather. Uh, asked me how I, how I was. I didn't live in it. That would that would have been a better story. I'm just picturing um, you singing for some reason, like in an actual barber barbershop quartet. I have been in barbershop quartets. Oh my god! Really? Yeah, I I, I, I sing. I'm tenor. gonna start interviewing you. Tell me about why you were in a barbershop quartet. Well, I have a lovely voice and I have a good falsetto because what I can uh, I can I sang. Um, 
Here, we'll show, we'll show him a slightly smaller one, I guess. Uh, what, what, what did you sing? Like, what was your part? Well, so, uh, I sang a lot in the children's choir when I was a kid. Same. Um, no, all right, there you all go. All right. And um, I was in there from, for, like, uh, up through 10th grade, so I developed a very good falsetto. Okay. So I sang a baritone in choir, mm -hmm. but in the barbershop, I sang tenor. Okay. Like, so I sang the really high parts. I can't do it anymore, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> I was also in choir, but then I was in a lot of bands, so I've forgotten how to, like, sing. Oh, right? yeah. I no, can that, yell that at you it. from yeah. the stage, yeah. but that's it. I can start doing like we should do a, hardcore uh, like vocalist like shout outs like all right, so I'll go shout out to little Mikey. You're the future of this scene. All ages <laughs> shows are really important. <laughs> all right. Yeah, no, I mean like uh, there's there's a lot that um, New York hardcore can learn from uh, game developing. We've had this discussion literally just two nights ago. So, because we don't come out of game development, Bethany and I, but we do come out of just bands and like just the kind of like just general, I don't know how, how to describe it. It's like uh, punk bands, like metal bands, like hardcore bands, like people who skate, people who do zines, people who do that. There was that kind of, that particular kind of like uh, scene has like a certain level of like, um, it has a certain vibe to it at its best, and it's the people that you meet, right? Like our, like you know, our friend Dan will be like, "Oh yeah, I just made a skate ramp in my office," and like, <laughs> and like, why did you do that or whatever? He's like, I just thought it'd be cool, and we're like, "You're right, man. That's awesome," you know? <laughs> like, it's, it's extremely cool. <laughs> when when Night in the Woods came out, we got a weird amount of pushback that we didn't we didn't anticipate of people going like, "So in our game, uh, May." Uh, is the main character. Uh, someone referred to her as the official fail daughter of the left, um, which was, I was like, thank you. Um, but, uh, and she's just this kind of like dirtball dipshit kid that you know down the street that we've either known or been. I've been both and known both uh, in my <laughs> life. And Wait, stuff. both? <laughs> I, I have both known the dirtball dipshit kid down the street and been the dirtball uh, dipshit I kid see. down the street. <laughs> Um, and stuff, and her friend, who's this kind of like punk guy named uh, Greg, wears like a cool leather jacket and stuff. Uh, he took his grandfather's helmet that he brought back from World War One with like the spike, the pickle up thing, and but then slapped an anarchy sticker on it, wears it around. It says no sort of connotation for any of it at all. And May's like, isn't that a, like a fascist hat? And he's like, no, there's an anarchy thing on it now. Okay, it's cool, <laughs> whatever. Um, but the um, and they go, they break shit, they smash light bulbs behind like the 7-Eleven basically that Greg works at. They go into the woods and have like little pocket knife fights and like break logs just because. Greg co co uh, cobbled together out of like a bunch of hunting targets because it's kind of like rural area uh, and uh, made it into this big monster and they shoot like his crossbow at it. And people would sometimes, like a lot of people responded to the game, they're like, yeah, that was me. Um, but then some folks responded like, who does this? This is so like nihilistic. They're out like they're out like fighting each other with knives and laughing about it. They're smashing things like oh, uh, and and that was the most bizarre feedback to us because we're like that's normal shit, right? Like, I, and it's not and, and some folks would, would would say like, well, I guess I wasn't like tough or cool, and I'm like that wasn't tough or cool shit back in like high school. That was just the we're bored and there's nothing to do and we're teenagers. Let's go break everything we can possibly do, like uh, break out in the woods or just goof off, or then that was just part of your, what you did at the time. That kind of spirit is something that is hard to find, I think, within games a lot. That's true, um, yeah. Like, just that kind of like, you know, hey, hey, let's go do this, that'll be cool. You know, break, break stuff, play loud music chill in the woods and it's fine you know well, and i think like i mean there's there's a lot that's missing in games where it's just like it's pure exploration yeah. um well i got a present um huh. you can find presents and cousins in this game yeah you can you can uh, scoop up cousins who are just other little friends that you can use to wow look at that uh the uh totally missed the ramp but that's that's, that's what's that's, that's part cool. of the game um yeah no it, but like i think like the idea of exploration in, in a lot of games is like is not super it's it's super encouraged of course like red dead red dead uh revolution or i did this red dead the, I revolution did, i did that in a podcast i just recorded and haven't released but i laughed uh -huh. about thinking like it was like a 
like Red Dead uh, Redemption, but in the mall, and like, <laughs> you're, like you're playing, you're doing a dance thing. Uh. Like that. Um, but no, Red Dead Redemption Two is coming out, and like people are loving it because it's uh, you know it's so exploratory, right? Like oh, you can do everything in this game. Um, so of course people like that, but people don't like just like needless exploration where it's like no there's no point to this you're not going to get anything out of it it's yeah. just like you're just rolling around like at this point this is all bonus what i'm doing now it doesn't matter i've won the level yeah you, you just you just keep playing you, you you've conquered the level here yeah and the, the king just says why don't you make it bigger there that's like that's the same ethos in night in the woods where it's like well why don't we just go out and do something stupid yeah <laughs> Well, because that's what a lot of life is, right? Like, a lot of life is is just, hey, let's go out and do something real dumb, right? Like A lot of teenage life is like that. Yeah, a lot of adult life is like that, too. Um, but, like, um, that that kind of just fun, that kind of, like, the aimlessness of hanging out with someone that you know really well. Because after a while, like, I mean, I'm, I'm 37, so it's like every time I hang out with anyone, there's a plan and, like, a scheduled time of when we are done at 9, and we are going and doing this because we're all tired constantly uh, and busy and have all these other things. Uh, how, how clutch is the afternoon show, folks? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just going to go to sleep directly after this. But, like, um, but like when you're stuck in your kind of small town with people you've known your entire life, a lot of it's just, like, we have nothing to do and have had nothing to do for 10 years, you know? <laughs> right. Um, there's, uh, and so... Being able to design around that, the like, let's go back to the mall, we haven't been there in 10 years just to see how it's changed, or we're going back here and we're, you know, there's this, uh, there's this element of kind of aimless just life that you get in those kind of things, and uh, you kind of just don't see enough of that in games because the, I think because people are really worried that you need a better uh, excuse to go do things well, than people, just go hang out with someone. Yeah, I mean, people are worried. People get mad. People got mad at me about the, my Fortnite article because they were like, "Well, I mean, why do you need like a reason besides fun to think about Fortnite?" And it's like I don't. It's like fun's yeah. great. Like I think people are worried that like they need their games to be profound and like mm -hmm. the profundity of just like having a good time is lost. Yeah, a little bit, and that's why like Katamari is like it's like. I could sit here and give you a Marxist analysis of Kairi Damari Damashi <laughs> for some reason. Yeah, well, there's no reason for it. But yeah. yeah, why? Yeah. Why? It's just good. Like, there's, there's, uh, it, which is not to say, like, oh, turn off your brain. It is, but it is to say that you don't need to do the work on right. this one. Yeah. It's just pretty good. Yeah. And you can just enjoy it for being pretty good. And you can think about it and you can come up with some stuff, but it's not a game. Sometimes I feel like I have to like uh, go into like a work of art or a game or a movie and go, all right, let me think about how to interpret this like in some way. I, I, I need to pull something out of this. Yeah. Whereas Katamari Damashi just gives. <laughs> you know. Well, we'll leave. We'll leave the king here. Hopefully, this isn't how you felt about the first half. But first half <laughs> is over. We are going to take a ten minute break. Uh, go use the restrooms. Get get some beer. Get some drinks. They have actually like really really good beers on draft, um, and in cans and just you know. Have a beer. Various uh, bowls, Have some wine. Barrels. Have some cider. And uh, we'll see you in 10 minutes. Stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Unless any of you want to be my next guest. My next guest. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, folks. Hey. Uh, this audience plant. Uh-huh. All right. So, uh, yeah. There's someone on the computer. Yeah, I guess get, get the computer up just for this point. We only have one outside caller. It is, it is my co-host on the very popular, very, very well-acclaimed uh, series, uh, No Cartridge After Dark. Um, eventually she'll be up there, but we can start having your talk now. Olivia, can we hear you? Okay, okay, I can hear you. Can we can't get the audio in or? Oh, okay, cool. We're standby. So, audience. <laughs> you get it, it, Scott? Can you like? Can you? Uh, can you vamp? I can vamp. I can vamp for a second. Why All right. Oh, who uh, who here's from uh, New York? <laughs> who here? All right. <laughs> New York. All right, look at this plant. Only in New York, baby. We don't got shit like this back in Pittsburgh. Look at these tables. They're so small. They're so square. They got the rounded edges. Nothing like this back in Dormont, Pennsylvania. I don't know why my coming to New York and is, thinks everything is exceptional New York guy has a Brooklyn accent. But, yeah. Already has a Brooklyn accent, yeah. The, the Pittsburgh accent is one of the most, like, hateful accents in America. Oh, there you I, go. I can't even do it, but it's just like, Yin's going downtown, Oh, Like, that's the best way I could describe it. If you ever go to Pittsburgh, you'll go, oh, there you are. that horrible thing I just heard. <laughs> Everyone's doing it here. Reconnecting. Um, 
Oh, can, can you bring oh, it up? Oh, no. Home? Can you hear me? Oh, no. Uh, maybe I'll try calling back. Yeah. We're sponsored today by Canada Oh, okay. Dry. Here we go. Here we go. We're actually getting sound, though. Let's see if she picks up. Hey, Liv. Hello. Hey. hey. It's Olivia. Her at is Spooky Oolong, and she is the co-host of the No Cartridge After Dark podcast. Olivia, welcome to the live show. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. From, from, uh, from Louisiana. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, do you have a question for Scott? I absolutely have a question. It'd for be Scott. great if you said no. <laughs> here, I'll, I'll let More you. More of a comment. I'll let you see him for the. For oh, thank you. Hi, I'm Hi, over Scott. here. Hi, Scott. So I was going to ask you a after dark style question. So I mm. know that <clears throat> someone hasn't been listening to his Patreon feed. Is That's uh, true. A big part of the Night in the Woods fandom, but for you, is shipping something that's ever been? Um, important to how you've related to the piece of art and if so what is your otp who do you yeah. ship scott jesus and me <laughs> um uh no because i didn't come up in like fandom circles like shipping is kind of like the thing that people do do we need to explain shipping to the audience here ship okay show of hands who does not know what shipping is I saw one person go no, and then a, like yes, and then a bunch of other people go no. Okay, just explain it to that one person. <laughs> okay, shipping is when there's two fictional characters. Ideally, they're fictional, and um, <laughs> you uh, you you get kind of enamored with the notion of them kind of being a couple or something. Often, this will take the form of like fan fiction or fan art, where you'll kind of expand upon the original fiction and be like, and this is how Kirk and Spock got together or something. Um, People have done that with our game, um, and uh, May and B is one of the big uh, ones. Maybe they would never work together. It would be a terrible, <laughs> terrible. Thing. I've seen but I've seen pictures of them with kids. They're they're fine. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it all worked out. It's fine. But like, uh, so no, it, it was never a part of um, my even understanding of how to interact with culture or fiction when I was growing up because I feel like shipping. Um, as we kind of now talk about it, is such like a subcultural thing, almost, mm -hmm. in the sense that fandom, with a capital L F, is its own subculture, essentially. It's its own fandom. Uh, fandom is a fandom. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Wow. I mean, we need a picture of us, like, on stage with just <laughs> that at the bottom. Fandom um, is a fandom. That kind of thing. So, like, uh, <laughs> but, yeah, so it was never a thing that I really even came much into contact with. Uh, the things that I had never come into contact with, really, before Night in the Woods, Fandom, shipping, furries. Wow, and now you're the king of all three. Now I have, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm enthroned. I've met a lot of really wonderful, very nice furries. Have you met Sonic Fox yet? No, but oh, I'm a, I, saw, I, I saw his, uh, his win at, uh, at uh, EVA, though. That was Man, pretty sweet. Guy. Oh, Sonic Fox is a whole other hour. Yeah. Um, Liv, uh, before you go, uh, my answer is Kitty Pride and Rogue. Yeah, uh, well, yeah. you have plenty of answers there. <laughs> Talk soon. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you to Olivia. Thanks. Bye. All right. All right. I always feel like such like I have a boring answer for that, just because like I didn't come up with any of these kind of online cultural circles of that sort. So like when people will say things like, "Oh, I ship May, and she's exactly like Kokotashi san from blah blah blah," and I'm like, <laughs> I have no idea what you're just. Just say, just say. Oh, yeah. No, oh, totally. 100% that. And then someone will get I on. I haven't seen the new one. Like, mm -hmm. what's that about? Like, is it good stuff? Well, someone or? will then reply to the tweet with, that is ext an extraordinarily problematic ship. I can't believe you said that. And I'm like, I don't know what anyone is talking about right now <laughs> at all. I don't know what the fucking Onceler is. What the hell? You don't know who the Onceler is? I do now. The, the guy from the, the book. The guy the from Lorax. the thing, yeah. yeah. But, well, apparently... There's the, there's the Lorax movie, and according to some people, is the most fuckable thing ever created. Wait, I couldn't tell what your face was doing oh. there. Because at first I thought you were going like... No, no. You're right. I'm not, I'm not into it. I don't like I it. I know I'm nothing like, about I'm the one slur other than he looks like he would do street magic. <laughs> All right, um, I had a question for you. But I can balance this matchstick. Anyway, go on. <laughs> and then he just balances it and it flicks it off and burns down a forest. Yep, um, that's how it goes. Uh, so uh, we only have 15 minutes for Q&A, and I want you guys to get a chance. So uh, we have someone in the audience 
uh, going around with a mic uh, for questions. If anyone has a question, um, maybe we need some house lights. I don't know. Uh, there yeah, there we go. Uh, anyone with a question, please uh, Night ask Night in the Scott. Woods, video games, Twitter. I think that's Oof, basically. Boy. Yeah, asking about Twitter, you know, at your own risk. <laughs> yes. Hi, how's it going? Hey. Uh, so one time on Twitter you said, I think it might be your, your <laughs> just, just to keep in theme with a uh -huh. Twitter themed afternoon, mm -hmm. uh, I think it might be your pin tweet, Scott. Uh, it's, I may also butcher this, but it's uh, make art, make rent, help others do the same. Yeah. Uh, this Sounds so earnest, but This whatever. is something that actually pops into my head a lot ever since I first read it. Really resonates with me. Uh, I was just wondering... How, uh, what kind of advice you would give for you know young artists, game devs, not young, anyone, any age, <laughs> just aspiring game artists, art, artists, musicians, mm. devs. How do we do that? What are, what are some ways Letters to do to that? Letters to a young Twitter follower. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, so I didn't go to college. Be careful. <laughs> yeah, uh, I didn't go to college. Um, there's, there's a lot of trajectories that you're supposed to do. Like people are like, oh, I went to school and I got a job out of that. I got an internship. Uh, if you're wealthy enough, you got an internship, and <laughs> you were in a position where those things are available to you, as opposed to just working at the grocery store, which is what I did. And um, God, that sounded like some really like, oh, unlike real people like me who worked at the Giant Eagle or something. But like the next but, twelve minutes will be Scott ranting about the white working class. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, <laughs> you, you can stand up for it. Um, <laughs> Our next guest, anyway. Matthew Heimbach. Yeah. <laughs> Fresh out of jail and divorce, <laughs> but like, um, so, uh, sorry, that com the, the Heimbach reference uh, just, just threw me completely off. I got Connor to groan. Go okay, ahead. there you go. So, um, yeah, no, uh, so I'm just self-taught. Uh, this is going to sound like a, a weird way of saying this, but for me, just scam your way into shit. The first time I ever had a job where I had access to a computer, um, it's like in the mid 2000s, I was in a band with a guy who uh, was a developer working at this uh, tiny web company in a suburb of Altoona, Pennsylvania that was run by extreme right-wingers who brought guns to work every day. That's a whole other podcast. But like, um, and, and I had done like, you know, art for like our, our band t-shirts and stuff. And the guy was like, they're looking for like a guy to do like flash intros to websites because that was just what you did at the time. And uh, for some reason, <laughs> and um, the, uh, and I got in there and just lied about knowing how to use Flash and how to do animation or anything. And then I just, um, they, and they didn't know enough about what they were talking about to know that I didn't know what I was talking about. And then I got the job and I learned on the job when they were like, this needs to be done by the end of the week. I'm like, cool, I'm just going to find out. I've never opened this before. And, and that was kind of it. Like when I had like my second studio job, I've only really had two studio jobs and they were just in like animation and that kind of stuff, doing uh, motion graphics and all that. Um, the second one really fudged what my actual uh, experience was um, in order to do that. So that's kind of like job-wise. It's just like have enough just to know what you're talking about a little bit and then fake the rest as best you can and just get in and uh, use their resources to learn what you need to do. Um, I mean, this is true for podcasting, too. I would say probably my biggest podcast outside of the Chapo guys was my one with you. And that was probably bigger at the time. And all I did to talk to Scott, we'd never talked before in our lives, and I said, uh, hey, would you like to talk about aesthetics on a podcast? And he said yes. So just have confidence in yourself that uh, anyone will respond to you in a positive way. Yeah, there you go. Um, but I think otherwise it's um, don't put all of your creative worth in how much money you make, which is a hard thing. You know, that, that tweet about like making rent is just like, you got to pay the rent until, you know, until next Tuesday after we do the revolution and then you'll be fine. But like um, <laughs> the, uh, but making it to that next Tuesday is difficult, right? Um, and it's easy to look around at people like, I have, I'm 37. I have people who were like 24 going like, man, I just missed my chance. And I'm like, at your age, here's me being a total dad here. I was, I had been in the workforce since I was 18. I was like in a shitty band and my third shitty band and working my fourth straight year at the Giant Eagle in Indiana, Pennsylvania. Like, you got time, right? This is why I hate those 30 under 30 lists that come out. Cause, and Because it makes people who were like 31 go like, 
oh man, <laughs> I'm never gonna get on this. We actually got an email this this <laughs> world exclusive. I've never <laughs> mentioned this before. We got an email from Forbes magazine this year and was like, "Are either of you two under 30?" <laughs> <laughs> I, I have posted some unkind things about both Forbes magazine <laughs> and the Forbes magazine, their literal model, the capitalist tool. <laughs> they literally called themselves a tool that is a capitalist. Uh, but like, Making it too easy. There's a yeah, trap. Yeah, um, the capitalist dipshit. So like, um, but a uh, very nice person contacted us and, uh, and, and said that. And I responded, I'm like, no, I just turned 37. And also... Back when we were under 30, we are not the people that you would have featured, <laughs> uh, which is probably a little snarky or whatever. You're not going to run out of time. You have time. Uh, survive and develop your, your stuff. The best thing you ever make is probably not going to be the thing you're thinking of right now, um, particularly um, if you're younger. Not, and it's not because of youth. It's because getting through the stuff that you want to make at first to maybe the more interesting stuff that you'll make later um, is something that takes time. For some folks, right off the bat, right? There's some folks are like, you know, I was in terrible bands when I was a teenager, but then there's some people who were in bands when they're 18 and I still listen to now and I'm like, man, this is like really wise or yeah, something. Yeah, we've all heard Silverchair. Yeah, we've all heard Silverchair. <laughs> <laughs> that was somehow the exact band I was thinking of because they were like that's 16. The, that's the band at 14. They were 14 when they put out their first record. I'm trying to think what I was doing at age 14 and none of it's good. Well, none, like, none of it was putting out King Nothing or what? No, that was a Metallica song. Yeah. I can't remember what the... Uh, Jesus, man. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> Fat of the Land, was that their album? Uh, I don't... Or that was Prodigy. Yeah, that was Prodigy. <laughs> Keep going. No, I'm, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> um, speaking of Prodigy, there is an Wait. Enya, Orinoco <laughs> Flow, and Smack My Bitch Up remix online, like mashup together. It is... 10 times better than either song. It's so good. <laughs> Go look that up. Anyway, survival is good. Every artist I know, like every fantastic artist I know, has a job that, you know, like people think, oh, uh, everyone else is like making money, like, making their career off of that, you know? Like we had like zero money until this game came out and people inexplicably liked it. Um, Explicably liked inexplicably. it. Inexplicably. What the fuck's wrong with you people? But like, um, <laughs> You know, like, we were in debt. The reason why we did a Kickstarter is because we were in debt and had no money, and I couldn't take, like, time off trying to find client work as an animator and an artist, you know, to, to go do that. So it's like everyone's struggling, except for the people who were never going to struggle to begin with. Um, that is, a, that is a, a thing that you have to take into account as far as your ability to make art and be able to pull something out of it. I think one of the reasons maybe that Night in the Woods is meaningful to us is because we got to talk about shitty bosses, and shitty jobs. We were just talking about this the other night, is that like, one of the cool things about, about the game was we just had a throwaway line where someone's like, yeah, it sucks because my boss schedules me for 30 minutes less than full time because at full time, they'd have to pay benefits. And me and almost everyone I know who's worked at like minimum wage jobs knows that feeling of, I'm working my ass off and getting underpaid. They could fire me at any time and they have sat there in their office and thought, what can I do to make sure I don't have to give them shit? Just nothing. I just want to take as much as I possibly can and give nothing back. Um, I think that that's something that we could talk about in the game, and just not a lot of people talk about that in video games, and that clicked with a bunch of people. It's the same stuff that like, you're sitting around with your friends you complain about, right? We were able to take those just mundane indignities <laughs> and the kind of shit that you have to deal with, um, unless you're just have a, born with a lot of resources, um, and we were certainly born with more resources than a lot of people, being able to take that experience and make something out of it. So that's the thing. It's like, you're going to struggle. Understand that you're going to struggle. It's going to be difficult. Struggling does not mean that you're a failure. Like, not like taking off in whatever way that you think someone else has. It does not make, make your, mean you're a failure. And maybe in that struggle, be able to take some part of that and put that into your work and put that out there because there's loads of people that just are desperate for someone to go, yeah, that thing you're going through, we're all going through that right now. And that's not you and you're not weird. The fact that your landlord raised your rent, that's your fucking landlord's problem. Like, that's not you. You didn't make them do that. Uh, anyway, sorry, that went on a rant. <laughs> we, um, we, we, got, we, we have four more minutes, so we have time for one okay, more. Yeah, sorry. And if you make Scott rant, we might get in trouble and, and, and get pushed past. <laughs> 
Ah, uh, this ginger ale, only in New York. <laughs> Canada Dry, that's how you know it's classy. <laughs> this might be bad for avoiding ranting, but uh, you talk, uh, you're very vocal online about worker empowerments and worker rights, especially in the game industry. And this is a topic that's been all over the news recently. And I'm wondering, like, for those of us who aren't really in the industry, we aren't necessarily developers, but we are either consumers or fans, what's something that you wish you'd see people either doing more or talking more about in order to sort of help advance that cause and help make sure that people who make these games actually get paid? Okay, um, it's a really, really quick answer. I'm going to talk really fast here. Okay, so at least to me, and there's, you're going to have varying answers from a lot of different developers, and uh, game development is a largely or an organized space, and game, game development culture, um, similar to a lot of work culture in the U.S. and elsewhere, um, people are, we very much see ourselves uh, as this is just the struggle that we have and that's how it is. It's like the divine right of kings or soliloquine quote, right? Of like, yeah, at some point, the divine right of kings just seemed like it was just how things were and it was unthinkable to not have that. We're also um, kind of hammered into this mold of being like, yeah, I got fucked over by, uh, by my boss, but that's just how it is. And you start to get some pride in that. Like you're a shark that can never stop swimming or you'll die. And you're like, yeah, I can fucking swim the best, you know? As opposed to going, why can't I stop swimming ever? <laughs> You know, I don't think sharks think that they would probably die if they thought that. I don't think they think of anything other than like, Aah! but like, um, they have sharks have two modes, which is just like, and Aah! but um, so um, anyway. Uh, Thanks for your question, Shark Fan sixty nine. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, I was trying to think of an I of an irony leftist shark name. Yeah, there think you go. of one by by the end of this, everyone. So. Um, the, uh, but um, at least for me, um, there's a thing called Games Work Game Workers Unite right now. Go follow it. It's just at Games Workers, Game Workers, I think, on Twitter. You can find it. And um, I talked to some people from the Australian branch a while back. Okay, very cool. cool. Yeah, people. yeah. Very cool. It's, a, it's kind of a fledgling uh, movement among a lot of game developers and people who were sympathetic to it um, to kind of push for worker organization, um, unions, co-ops, just general stuff, right? Um, I think for me and other people that I've talked to, like you can like boycott games, right? Like you could go all go boycott Red Dead Redemption 2 just because Rockstar treats a lot of its employees like shit, right? And that the employees in those spaces do not have um, the power, organize, the organized power to be able to push back. Because even if a game, even if a studio has really amazing conditions, those workers still need organized power to be able to set those conditions. Because if the boss comes in tomorrow, and has the rabies from 28 days later, like, you know, you're really relying a lot on having a cool boss, right? So, like, people need power to be able to push back against that. From fans being vocally supportive of developers and workers who are going through that, that morale does, that is a, is a thing. And I don't know if you've heard this about gamers. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes they can be less than supportive about this kind of thing. There is already, there is a built-in because of just kind of how reactionary a lot of consumer culture is, a lot, a lot of gamer culture and nerd culture is, that is going to push back and come for people, literally, who are organizing. And, yeah. that's, and that's to say nothing about when some of these studio heads go, well, these people want to organize, we could probably nudge some of our fans to make life terrible for them, right? Yeah. We could fire them, we could make a big example of them. We've already seen a few little things like that. That's just labor organizing 101. And I'm, a, I'm kind of a novice on it, so like, that's not me going like, here's my, like, uh, um, like, this is me with a cane, I think. I was tapping on the <laughs> stage there. <laughs> clunk, clunk, clunk. Um, so um, I think being hyper supportive of developers, like, you can boycott whatever you want, but like boy boycotts, um, unless they're massive, which probably not gonna be able to put together, um, and unless they're tied in with worker action, like if workers are like, we're on strike, don't fucking cross this picket line. Don't fucking cross the picket line. Like that kind of boycott, that kind of consumer action in tandem with worker action, I think at least is very effective and cool. Um, and beyond that, as, as a consumer, it's difficult because we're taught that like as consumers, like that's our main power, right? Mm -hmm. Like, well, I'm not gonna buy a Canada Dry anymore because it turns out it's not from New York, you know? Like, <laughs> no one who works at Canada Dry gives a fuck. They care about bad press. You know, they care about all these other things that may affect their bottom line or their, like, you know, shareholders and that kind of thing. You know, over the past week, I don't know if you've noticed, Rockstar seems a little sensitive about this shit. So, like, um, 
that, that, that change has to come from workers and they need as much support and help as they can possibly get. Being vocally out there talking about this um, and not allowing the culture itself to be so reactionary against it that it helps stifle it further than actual material power is going to actually do. I said actually like three times. Well, actually. And so, like, so, and we're out of time, but the, the, the thing that you should do in terms of consumer power, buy from good uh, just working studios. Uh, Scott and Bethany's studio is a, is oh, yeah, we're talking about it, but they have a, a lovely setup. <laughs> yeah, we're, uh, we're set, uh, our next studio that we're actually in the process of doing, I'm talking to a lawyer this week, is we're setting up a like a actual like straight up worker cooperative for our yeah. next game, which would be cool. Uh, there's not a lot yeah. of those, so we're <laughs> <laughs> yes, we're heroes. Yeah, uh, you guys, you guys <laughs> are the people who make dead cells, just like uh, oh yeah, dead cells is made by a fucking like like anarchist syndicalist. Yeah, like they specifically call themselves syndicalist, and as someone who likes like the Wobblies, I'm like. All right. And Dead Cells is good. So like yeah, buy Dead Cells is one of the best games of the it's year. It's unbelievable. But yeah, bu buy buy games from people who are doing cool stuff. I mean, yeah. they need your support in ways that you can actually uh, mobilize. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Scott, for coming. Thank you for yeah, coming. Yeah, absolutely. Anytime. Anytime. Thanks all, and uh, we'll see you next time. <laughs>